Thank you everybody for joining us today for our presentation on the top 10 mistakes that board members make. Uh, this is a topic that when we were coming up with, we were trying to come up you know, different ideas and I thought this was a, a pretty, maybe a lively discussion. So uh, lots of things can go wrong within associations. A lot of things go right. So, but Steve will help navigate all the various things that uh, we have challenges with throughout the association management world. But um, my name is Ben Rhodes. I am the Senior Vice President with CAMS located in Charlotte, North Carolina, one of the eight regions that we do serve. Um, Steve Black is an attorney here in the Charlotte area, and so, but he is licensed in both North and South Carolina. We'll be talking about all the various things. Um, before we get started, I wanted just to uh, remind everybody that's been with us before, but also announce we are in our 30th year of operation as CAM. So um, we are celebrating this 30th anniversary by doing a, a giveaway. Um, last month's winner was Tarasa Long with the Ratcliffe Association. So uh, congratulations, Tarasa. We'll be sending out a gift card. And then at the end of this session, we will also be doing another uh, gift card for the next month's lucky winner. So uh, please stay with us till the end and um, we'll draw that name and um, our marketing folks will follow up with you shortly after that. So also as a reminder, uh, we do record these sessions and if you um, wanna review anything, uh, we will have these posted on our website at camsmgt.com. So you can find that under the board member section and follow the webinar link. So we have a number of different webinars that we've hosted over the last several months. Uh, you can view all those as well. But um, Steve, I will turn it over to you and um, I'm gonna hide my screen. All right, great. Thank you, Ben. Uh, well, thank you everyone for attending uh, tonight. Uh, we're gonna go through some really interesting um, mistakes that board of directors make, and I've got some good stories for you. I will tell you by kind of way of further introduction, uh, I was on the board of directors of every association that my wife and I have lived in uh, since we got married. And that is eight different associations, eight different neighborhoods. I've held every position. Uh, I think I've at least seen most issues happen. Um, and I also practice law in only this area. So, so uh, I've got a lot of experience doing this and I'm excited about kind of, kind of sharing some of that with you tonight because I made some of these mistakes uh, early on as a board member, even though I was a lawyer, I wasn't doing exclusively HOA work 20 years ago when I was on some of the boards. And so uh, I, I, somewhat reminiscent uh, of what I've accomplished in the past and, and done in the past. So I want to start off tonight with a with a poll. So let me launch my poll here just to give me an idea of who is with us tonight. So if you don't mind, you should see the poll there. Uh, are you a single family home community, a town home community, condominium community, or mixed? Uh, everything we talk about tonight is going to be relevant to everybody, but I just, I like to have an idea so I can maybe tailored a little bit uh, to the larger group. Wow. We've got a good split here, an excellent split. So I'll show the, I'll show you the results here in just a second. All right. So it looks like we have a single family and you can see single family, 33%, townhome, 9%. Condominium, 41%, and mixed 16%. So that, that's a great spread uh, for tonight's discussion. Again, all of what I'm talking about applies to all of you. So but that kind of gives you an idea who, who you all are um, for me. All right. First, 
let me give you a little bit of an overview because this is going to touch on every topic that we talk about tonight. What the law expects of HOA board members. And if you've heard me speak before, you've seen this before because it's so important to me for my board members and for board members in general to have an understanding of what the law expects of you. Okay, so number one is you're expected to use the business judgment rule. And all of these mistakes we're going to talk about tonight, keep that in the back of your mind. What was the business judgment? What would the business judgment rule have dictated on that particular issue? And the business judgment rule is, as a board member, you're running a company. And running a company, you're required under the law to use good business judgment. What does that mean? That means that you're going to take all the information in that, that you get, maybe do a little bit of investigating yourself, and then make a good corporate type business decision. Okay, Sounds simple, doesn't it? What I find a lot of board members doing is, is giving me good neighbor judgment decision, okay? In other words, I like Sarah down the street. Yeah, she's violating the restrictions, but she's such a nice lady. Let's let her slide. That's a good neighbor judgment rule, and that's not what the law is. It's a good business judgment rule. Next, reasonably prudent person, okay? The law actually expects you to act like a reasonably prudent person. What's that? That's a person who looks around, pays attention, you know, ask some questions every once in a while and don't just rubber stamp things and rubber stamp decisions. Act like a reasonably prudent person. The one that my clients get into uh, trouble with the most is uniform actions and enforcement. The law expects you to treat everybody the same, okay? If Bob is delinquent by $1,000 and so is Sue, you have to treat them the same, okay? Now that sounds really straightforward, but it's amazing to me how often uh, boards will, again, Sarah's such a nice lady, let her keep her fence until the end of the summer, but Bob, he's a jerk, and let's go after his fence right now. There's really no legal justification to treat people differently like that. So uniform actions and enforcement, and, and this will all blend together with all the 10 mistakes we're going to go over tonight, uh, but it gives you some great groundwork. Now, as a board member, one of your questions should be, I'm a volunteer. I'm not getting paid. What happens if I get sued? You know, what are the legal protections if I make one of these mistakes? OK, I want you to be I want you to relax about that. OK, as long as you're following the good business judgment rule, acting like a reasonably prudent person uh, and, and enforcing things uniformly, you should be fine. Why? Because there's several different layers of protection for board members. One is this indemnification provided by governing documents of the association. What that means is in your documents. There is language, most likely, that says the association will protect and defend their board members or they'll indemnify the board members. That means if Sarah sues the association and you as a board member, the association has a duty to step up, hire your lawyer, defend the case, and take care of you. That same duty to hire a lawyer, indemnify you, protect you, uh, is also in the statutes in North Carolina and South Carolina. So you kind of have two layers of protection there as a volunteer board member. And then there's the directors and officers insurance. Most of you have that, if not all of you, I'm sure. Write that down to ask your manager. I'm sure the answer is yes. Uh, directors and officers insurance is a insurance policy that you can buy that covers your decisions. You're gonna deny that fence. You're gonna deny that shed or that pool and the homeowner sues. Well, DNO insurance will most likely step up, hire the defense lawyer, and litigate the case at no expense to you and probably at no expense to the association. It, it's good stuff. Now, you can always be named in a lawsuit, but you should be defended by the association's lawyer or the lawyer that's uh, picked by the insurance company. And chances are the suit against you individually will be dismissed very early on. Okay, so those are the protections. And again, I kind of felt like I had to go through these because we're talking about the top 10 mistakes made uh, by associations that I see. All these protections that I've mentioned, only available to you if you operate in good faith, okay? And part of that is using the good business judgment rule. And, and But the other part of it is just, you can't have your own agenda, okay? You can't be furthering your own agenda, I should say. For example, some of you may have experienced this. I've experienced it on a board I was on. Randy got himself elected to the board of directors for the sole purpose of keeping his fence. You know, the association had come after his fence and this was the way he was gonna do it. So. That's not good faith, and that'll get you into trouble. So furthering a personal agenda or furthering an agenda for your spouse or your neighbor or your best friend down the street, um, probably something you want to talk about and look into. All right, second poll. All 
All right, a board of directors can make a decision by majority vote using email, true or false. So uh, the president sends out an email that says, uh, let's change the flowers up front, front to blue. Please you know, email me back. And if you have five board members, if three of those board members email back, yes, change the flowers, is that a valid vote by email? Just a majority vote by email. All right, we've got it. Wow, it's kind of neck and neck here, true or false. Uh, I'll go ahead and cut it off here. Very interesting. 49% said that it's true that you can vote by email, a majority vote by email. 51% say it's false. It is false. Okay. And this, again, we're talking about the top 10 mistakes being made, and this is one of them. Improper voting by the board of directors. And you all, this happens all the time. It doesn't surprise me at all that 49% of you thought it was okay. I mean, it doesn't surprise me at all. It is, it is very, very common. Um, and here's the way this works. There's only two options for the board to vote. And that's at a duly called meeting. So you, your board meetings on Thursday night and you show up and you've got a quorum and you vote. That's one way to do board business. The other way is by unanimous written consent by all directors. So here's the trick. It has to be unanimous. So if you're sending an email out, let's change the flowers to blue at the front. As long as you get all the home, all the board members to, to send back yes, that's fine. It passes, but it has to be unanimous and it has to be everybody on the board. Here's where the boards get caught up on this. If you have a board of five and three of them vote back, yep, turn, make them blue, email vote. That's not enough. You've got to go get the other two to email you and say yes, okay? Email consent works. I was just mentioning this, but it must be unanimous. A okay? very common problem. And yes, it is a pain. You don't like it as a board of director. The managers certainly don't like it as managers to have to get unanimous consent uh, in between meetings, but, but it is clearly, uh, clearly required. Let's talk about Bob. I've made Bob up. Bob is that board member who's just difficult. You know, some of you out there may have Bob on your board, maybe more than one Bob. And Bob, if you send out the email about the flowers, let's change the flowers to blue up front, fire it off. It's not that big of a deal. It's flowers, right? Should be easy. You should get five yeses pretty quick by email. But Bob either doesn't respond at all. Well, you don't have unanimous consent. Or Bob votes no. Well, you have to have unanimous consent. So Bob didn't let it pass. So the Bobs can really cause problems with this unanimous voting. And so what I would suggest is give Bob a call. President, call Bob or the manager might want to call Bob and say, hey, Bob, just want to make sure you saw the email. Uh, please send your, your response in. Or if Bob voted no, so president maybe calls Bob and says, hey, Bob, tell me what your thoughts are on this. You know, can I change your mind? What, what are your questions? See if you can talk Bob into sending an email. If you can't, the way you fix that is you call a board of director meeting, okay, president, you send an email out that says, okay, we didn't get a unanimous consent on the blue flowers. So I'm calling a board meeting that's gonna be about 30 seconds long on Tuesday. Uh, maybe it can be by telephone, can be by Zoom, can be in somebody's front yard. You call a duly called meeting. You get together, call the meeting to order. The only piece of business is let's vote on the flowers. Well, that's at a duly called meeting. So you can do it by a majority vote. So if only three of them show up, they can vote yes. Or if all five shows up and Bob still votes no, that's okay. You're at a duly called meeting, so a majority controls at a duly called meeting. Not popular, I, I understand. Not a popular position, but that, that's clearly the law. All right, let's go on to the next top mistake. Poll number C. Nigerian dwarf goats, oh, I need to show this to you. Nigerian dwarf goats, cows, sheep, and pigs are livestock, are not livestock, or it depends. Nigerian dwarf goats, cows, sheep, and pigs are livestock, are not livestock, or it depends. 
and, and this is one of my favorite stories, and it's actually a case out of North Carolina as to what happened with this. All right, and in the poll, show it to you all. This is great. 46% say our livestock and 54% and say it depends. I would have bet the farm, it's terrible, bet the farm that they were livestock. I mean, I would have taken this case all day long. In this case, get you back to where. All right, let me introduce you to Fred and Barney. Fred and Barney are two Nigerian dwarf goats. Uh, the case was that a homeowner that lived in a land development, a homeowners association, single family homeowners association, uh, brought these Nigerian dwarf goats home. Uh, the, they wore sweaters. They slept inside. They had little beds, kind of like dog beds, but I guess they're goat beds. Uh, they learned to fetch. They were walked on leashes around the, uh, around the neighborhood. And the association's restrictions said no livestock are permitted. I mean, most of you have that kind of language, you know, no livestock, no farm animals. Uh, so the association sent a letter, hey, Fred and Barney have to go. They fought this thing and they fought this thing hard um, all the way to the appellate courts. And the appellate court said that they were not livestock uh, because they were basically treated like pets. They had sweaters, they slept inside, they could fetch, they were walked on leashes. I mean, they, the court said they weren't livestock. Okay, so it depends. Uh, depends on how you treat the animal as to whether or not it's livestock. So, you know, those, those of you who said it depends, uh, I think you were right. Uh, on that logic, then I could go buy a cow, full grown cow in my plan development, in my homeowners association, bring it home, put a big sweater on it, uh, let it sleep in the garage, give it a big bed, walk around on a leash, and it still wouldn't be livestock. Uh, and I use a cow because I can't think of anything that's more of, li of, of livestock than a cow. But according to the logic uh, in the case, uh, it would be a pet and not a, and not a uh, not livestock. All right, so what mistake is this? That, that was a great, that was a great uh, example of one of the mistakes that boards make. And that is the rules and regulations versus restrictions in the common area. The point of the story I told you about the Nigerian dwarf goats is this. The courts are looking very critically at language in restrictive covenants now, okay? 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I think that case would have turned out differently. It would have been livestock and Fred and Barney would have had to go. Uh, but the courts are looking very closely. And, and I think the pendulum is kind of swinging towards the homeowners in favor of homeowners as to their free use of their property. And so that makes it more difficult for associations to enforce what we believe uh, are the restrictive covenants and the rules and regulations. So point number one I want you to walk away with tonight is even though your restrictions may appear clear, livestock, you got to really look at them now. OK, and, and one of the ones that pops into my head is commercial vehicles. You know, your restrictions may say no commercial vehicles. Well, what's a commercial vehicle? If a goat is not livestock, what in the world is a commercial vehicle? I mean, what what's the definition of a commercial vehicle? So you got to really look at your language. That's point number one. Point number two is that you've got to make sure you're using the right governing documents in your enforcement. OK, the next mistake that's such a big mistake I see is Boards using rules and regulations instead of restrictive covenants or not having restrictive covenants and trying to create them by using rules and regulations. I'll explain. Rules and regulations are almost always about common area, okay? Your pool, your clubhouse, your walking trail, your open area, common area, owned by the association. And the board of directors can absolutely adopt rules and regulations by themselves. Next meeting, you're at Sarah's dinner, dining room table, having your meeting. If somebody wants to make a rule about the pool, let's close the pool at seven instead of eight. All in favor? Aye. You just made a new rule. Okay, that's okay. Boards can do that uh, all day long. They must be reasonable. Okay, rules must be reasonable. Um, I use dog waste area, parking, dog weight limit. For example, you can't, I don't think it would be reasonable to make the only dog waste area at the front of the neighborhood when that's almost a 16th of a mile or an eighth of a mile for some of your homeowners, okay? I don't think that'd be reasonable. So you just have to be reasonable about it when you're making a rule and sitting around the dining room table. 
be really careful, okay? When you're making rules as a board of directors around the dining room table, there's a lot of pitfalls and you can unintentionally violate the Americans with Disabilities Act or the Fair Housing Act, okay? Um, that's a whole different presentation, a whole different seminar, but uh, just be aware that you need to ask your lawyer. Say, we just made up this rule, is this okay? Okay, I would encourage you to have your lawyer look at it uh, to make sure you're not stepping into that minefield. Okay, the difference between rules and regulations, those are about common area, and restrictive covenants. Okay, restrictive covenants are the, are the vehicle where you control conduct on someone's private lot. Okay, that's the difference. Rules and regulations are for common area that the board can do alone. Restrictive covenants are controlling people's conduct on their lots, okay? These usually require approval by the membership of either 67%, 75%, or 90% approval of the membership, okay? Uh, and I think that makes sense. I mean, if you're going to control people's conduct on their own private lot land, you better have some support from the membership. So, um, and, and, you know, examples of this might be a dog weight limit. Okay, no dogs over 20 pounds. Well, that's gonna obviously control conduct inside a house, townhome, condo, single family home, doesn't matter. So you better get an amendment to the declaration. Parking, you know, no parking on the grass. You gotta park in your driveway. You have to use your garage first before you can park in your driveway. You know, all of those are trying to control conduct on private property. So you have to have a restrictive covenant, which means you have to have the membership vote. Big one. Uh, location of storage and trash cans, okay? You have to have your trash can out of sight, back of the house, not visible from the street, uh, in an enclosure. If it's on their private property, they own that land, then it's got to be a restrictive covenant, and it's got to be in your declaration. I see this more often than, than most, where the board alone at the dining room table has created a rule and regulation. All trash cans must be returned behind the house within 24 hours of trash pickup, okay? If that was done by the board alone and only the board alone and the trash cans on, you know, you're trying to control it on private property, that's not enforceable, okay? That happens all the time. So be careful with that. Maintenance of property. I threw this one in because it's such a hot topic in the summertime. Private property, their house, their lot, their land, and, the declaration may say owners must maintain their property, okay? Owners must maintain their property. Go back to the Nigerian dwarf goat case. What does maintain your property mean? Owners must maintain their property. There's no standard. There's no details. It just says maintain your property. I think a court would have a really hard time with that, um, enforcing that, because it doesn't have any detail for the homeowner to, to follow. And so what I've seen is boards at the dining room table will kind of create a rule or regulation or maybe a clarification of the declaration that says, this means your grass can't be over seven feet or seven inches tall, or this means you must blow off your driveway, or this means you must. So they're kind of expanding the recorded declaration language of maintenance as a rule and regulation. And, and I think that's got some problems. So just be careful with that. All right. Just an example, single family lots. This is a neighborhood. This is actually a neighborhood we used to live in. Uh, and this was our lot, okay? So if they wanted to make me move my trash can or put my trash can around the back of my house, that would require a restrictive covenant, right? Uh, if they wanted me to have a dog weight limit, that would have to be a restrictive covenant, clearly. Now, here's the fun part about this one. This is a private road, okay? This is a private lot uh, drive. So it's common area. It's owned by the association. So can the association board at the dining room table make a rule and regulation about the road? Sure, as long as it's reasonable. So could you say no cars parking on the road? I think so. Could you say everybody has to walk in a clockwise direction? You know, we're on this side of the road or that side of the road? I don't know. I mean, is that reasonable? I don't know. I can make an argument both ways, but that gives you a good example. This is where it gets tougher. Townhomes. Okay. This is the owner's lot. I hope you can see my cursor, but this is the owner's lot, this rectangle here, okay? Clearly, this is the inside of their house. You can't dictate by rule or regulation what they do in their house. We talked about that. This is common area. You can absolutely create reasonable rules and regulations out here. 
What about on the patio? See, this is their outdoor patio, but it's within their property. Okay. So my position would be, you got to have a recorded restrictive covenant to control what happens on their, on their patio. For example, no smoking outside on the patios. Well, that's their land. That's their property. So I think you'd have to have a recorded restrictive covenant to control that behavior. Now, could you say no smoking in the common area? Of course. All right, poll D. Okay, the following can be prohibited by the Architectural Review Committee under the law. Okay, so these are things that can be prohibited. Satellite dishes on the front of the house, rain barrels attached to the downspouts, you know, catch rainwater, all of the above, or solar panels on the rear of the house. And this is probably the hardest question I've got for you tonight. So the following can be prohibited. Satellite dishes on the front of the house, rain barrels attached to the downspouts, all of the above, solar panels on the rear of the house. All right, we've got a good split coming. All right. Here are the, here's what you all came in on. Satellite dishes on the front of the house, 18%. Can be prohibited, they say. Rain barrels attached to the downspouts, you think 16% of you think that can be prohibited. All of the above can be prohibited. And solar panels, uh, solar panels on the rear of the house. Okay, so you see the details there? Here's the way this works, okay? One of the top mistakes, is overstepping on architectural control for rain barrels, satellite dishes, downspout, you know, all of those things. Uh, when an architectural control committee oversteps, okay, goes beyond their authority, there are two areas where associations get sued the most, most often. Number one is in collections, okay? We're trying to foreclose on somebody's house, they may sue us back, that, that, that can be expected. But number two, very close second, is for uh, ARC decisions. You denied their pool, you denied the color of their house, and they think you're being arbitrary and capricious, or they think that you are selectively enforcing or whatever, they will sue over architectural control. So important topic. The key to not getting sued and the key to not making mistakes on architectural control is to understand the standards, okay? And what I mean by that is a court is gonna be looking for what did you measure this by? What, how did you decide to deny that pool, okay? And 95% of the time in North Carolina and South Carolina, 95% of the time, the standard in the declaration or the master deed in South Carolina is harmonious and consistent, okay? Bear with me. So that's what you're measuring it by. Is that pool harmonious and consistent with the rest of the neighborhood, okay? Do we have other pools? If we do, do, are the pools, do the pools look like that? Um, if we don't have pools, is it still harmonious and consistent? Do we have hot tubs? Do we have koi ponds? Do we have, you know, is, is the topography um, good for pools? So harmonious and consistent. Here's where we get into trouble. Let's say that there are 15 outbuildings that the developer approved right? Before the board was ever in place, the developer approved 15 outbuildings, which they shouldn't have done, okay? It looks terrible. Well, now you're in control as a board of directors, and the 16th person applies for outbuilding. Hey, here's my application for my outbuilding. Looks just like those other 15. Their argument is it's harmonious and consistent because you have 15 others out here. It looks exactly the same. It is harmonious and consistent. So it would be hard to deny that 16th outbuilding. Now, if there were 20 lots in the neighborhood total and 15 had outbuildings, I think you've got to approve it. If you have 500 lots and there's only 16 outbuildings, I'm not convinced that it's harmonious and consistent with the entire community. Just, But just be aware that you ought to be able to articulate, you ought to be able to say out loud that that pool is either, that's harmonious and consistent because of A, B, and C approved, or it's not 
harmonious and consistent, and it's denied because of A, B, and C. We don't have any other ones like this. Your lot is in a different location. It's more visible, whatever the reasons are. So there's a case on point in North Carolina anyway that's real specific that says if you deny somebody's application, you should be able to articulate why. And in fact, the letter that goes back to them is supposed to say why it was denied and tell them you know, why it was denied and, and improve their chances of submitting an application later uh, to that would pass or that would be approved. So primarily aesthetics. This is one of my favorites. Be careful uh, with other structural or permitting, requir permitting requirements. Here's what's happening and, it, and it's been happening for 20 years. The architectural application should explain what it looks like, okay? What color is it? How tall is it? Where's it gonna be located? What's it look like? If I'm standing in the street, I'm looking at it, okay? Not how structurally sound it is, not if it's been permitted by the city, not if an architect has looked at it, that really is not our job, okay? And I've seen a lot of architectural request forms that says, please attach your city permit, okay? I, my suggestion is not to get involved in that, and here's why. Number one, there's no obligation to, okay? The declaration doesn't require that you do it, but more importantly, in my opinion, I think it creates liability for the association when you wouldn't have to otherwise. For example, let's say somebody puts on a second story deck, structural, right? It looks good, looks great. It should be approved. But the, the architectural committee or the board went on to say, we'd like to see the engineering drawings. Okay, well, we get the engineering drawings and we approve it. Well, then it collapses a year later. I think the association might be defendant number three or four in that lawsuit because we looked at it, we, we approved it. So you just don't need to go there uh, and there's no, there's no benefit to it for the association. I've actually had uh, clients who want the names of the electricians and the names of the plumbers and the license numbers of these contractors on the architectural application. Please don't do that for the reasons we just discussed. Uh, architectural control should only be about the exterior, okay? Only about the exterior. If they have a red ribbing, um, red paint in the living room that you can see blind, you know, blinding you from the road on the inside in their living room, you don't have control over that. Very common, we want them to have white blinds. Don't have control over that either. That's on the inside, okay? Uh, now, you could try to pass an amendment because it's on their private property, on their land, Amendment to the declaration with 67, 75, or 90 percent vote. And if it passes, well, then yeah, you can control inside their house, but otherwise, only outside. All right, back to our poll. Satellite dishes have FCC protection. Okay. Um, what that means is technically, uh, associations are not supposed to require prior approval. Okay, just for architectural reasons. Okay, there's an FCC ruling and commentary on that. Now, there are safety concerns that we can raise. Well, where are the cables going to go and is, could it fall on somebody? I mean, there are things that we can, can argue as to why we should be involved in their location. But there's some really strong protections for satellite dishes to be located anywhere they can get a signal or a good signal. Okay, uh, there's a federal statute called the OTARD Act over the air receptacle devices act that says associations or restrictive covenants can't unreasonably interfere with the signal from outer space. And what that means is you can't say you got to put it in the backyard if they can only get a signal in the front yard. You can't unreasonably increase the cost of the dish. Hey, we want you to build a special screening for it or, you know, spend $350 to paint your dish when that may void the warranty and increase their cost. And lastly, you can't unreasonably delay the installation of a dish, which means an architectural application process, okay? And there's a pretty strong commentary that says requiring an application, requiring them to wait for the results and requiring them to get approval is an unreasonable delay in their satellite dish. Now, I've got ways to kind of work around that a little bit. Um, and, you know, if you don't use our law firm, I'm sure the attorney you use, you can talk to them about that, but it takes quite a bit of Quite a bit of work to, to draft up the policy that's needed to get as much control over satellite dishes as possible. Um, solar panels. In North Carolina, there is a statute that says that we can prevent them from being on the front facade of the house, the front roof of the house, okay, uh, visible from some other public places. Uh, but they're 
pretty much available on the backside and in the yard and some other places. Rain barrels, we can still deny those, you know, all day long. Uh, but in South Carolina, uh, you do not have the satellite dish issue does apply to South Carolina also because it's a federal federal issue. Uh, but there is currently a solar panel um, statute being worked on right now. It hasn't passed and it may not pass this year, but it is being worked on right now. In fact, by one of my partners in the firm is, is being is involved in the drafting of that. Uh, so we're doing what we can to help protect uh, on the solar panel front. All right, next mistake, top mistake is the not reasonably raising dues, okay? Business judgment, you know, we said that earlier, right? Business judgment plus inflation, prices go up, equals the need to increase dues. That's the argument. I mean, if, if, if somebody says we shouldn't increase dues this year, well, then was there inflation? You know, the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, is always at least two or three percent. And that's that kind of a gauge on inflation. So to argue that we don't need to raise dues at all is a really tough sell uh, because inflation. There are some really fascinating cases out of the appellate courts um, that say that a homeowners associations are like many governments, okay? Which makes sense because you have elected officials, the board, you have dues that you have to pay, taxes, uh, and there's kind of a, a due process part to, to all, the, all the steps. So if the government raises taxes or increases taxes, then doesn't an association uh, by definition need to be raising their taxes or their dues anyway? Is there a duty to reserve money? Okay, this is a hot topic. Hey, Steve, do we have to put money away for the pool, for the roofs or the clubhouse? Do we have to? Is it a duty? Are we obligated to? There is nothing in the law that requires an association to reserve money. Now, your governing documents, your particular governing documents may absolutely require it. So you need to look at your governing documents. It may say you have to do 10% a year. It may say uh, that you have to do something. Now, should you reserve money? Yes, absolutely. If you have any kind of long-term capital costs, roofing, pavement, pools, uh, anything like that, you should absolutely be reserving. I had a president of an association uh, that had been on the board for 20 years. That president was adamantly opposed to raising dues, uh, which is probably why he kept getting elected. Uh, but uh, at the end, when he, uh, actually he passed away, when he passed away and his successors came in, uh, the association was very tough on money. I mean, they were broke. Uh, they had a pool, clubhouse, parking lots, uh, and they didn't have any money. And so while he may have been Make, the membership may have been supporting that for years. Nobody wants their dues to go up, of course. They may have supported that for years because they kind of think about the now. Well, it all comes back to you. It really does. So you have to be careful with that. If you limit the increasing of dues, then really only two things are going to happen. You're going to end up needing a special assessment at some point. Okay. And what that means is you're going to have to go to the membership in most cases and say, hey, we haven't been increasing dues like we should. Now we need everybody to pay $2,000 to do whatever work needs to be done. And here's the kicker. Special assessments almost always have to be voted upon. So the membership has to vote in favor of it. Sometimes that's as high as 67% of the membership has to vote to specially assess themselves $2,000. Good luck passing that in a lot of cases. So then you're stuck because you don't have the money to do what you need to do. You can't get the special assessment passed. So one of your last options is to get a loan, go to a bank, borrow the money, pay interest. The problem with that is this, they're gonna look at the association's financials, see that you've been running in the red for the last two years, five years, 20 years, and aren't going to give you the loan. And so I have clients right now that are in desperate need of money and they can't raise their dues enough. Their special assessment efforts have failed and the banks won't even look at them. And so they've had their pool closed for the last two years. And of course, a closed pool basically falls apart. So I would tell you that every year you need to have a serious conversation about increasing your dues. And if you are not going to increase them, you should have a very clear, articulable, explainable reason why you're not increasing the dues. All right, mistake number five, failing to take quick collection action. 
been doing this 20 years now. Okay. I've been collecting HOA dues for, for, for more than 20 years now. Smaller debts are far easier to collect than larger debts. No kidding. Right. So if you owe $400 and I come after you, chances are you can pay that now or maybe in a couple of weeks or maybe a month, you could pay that. But it's done. The homeowner's happy or not being foreclosed on and the client's happy, got the money. If you turn them over when they owe $2,000, much different story, much different story, far more difficult to collect. And chances are they're going to be walking through the, the legal process much further, which is more attorney's fees, et cetera. You're not doing any favors for the homeowners by delaying or allowing them to get further behind. I, let me tell you, I was on my own board, as I've mentioned, for a very, very long time for different associations. I've sat with board of directors as they're my client and heard them say, well, you know, it's it, Mrs. Johnson or, 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 you know, it's only $400 that they owe, but let's wait. You know, they just don't want to pull the trigger to turn them over for collections because it's only $400. Well, the next year it's $800. And then it's, you know, and so the nicer you are to the homeowner, this sounds terrible, but it's true. The nicer you are to the homeowner in not collecting, the further you're putting them behind and the harder it's going to be for them to catch up. So the, the, the point I would, I'm trying to make is turn them over early when the debts are smaller. It truly is the kinder, more neighborly thing to do, believe it or not. Business judgment. We talked about this earlier. What does a business do? when their customers uh, owe them $400, okay? Uh, they will send demand letters. Uh, they may sue in small claims court. Uh, so the, the point I'm trying to make is you need to act like other creditors. Uh, and one of my favorite analogies is if you, if you don't make your car payment for three or four months, what happens? They come and get your car. If you don't make your mortgage payment for three or four months, maybe six months, the bank starts making foreclosure noise, okay? You don't make your credit card payment for two or three months and they cut your credit card off and they come after you. So those are other creditors. And I think there's a strong argument that you need to act like other creditors. We're a little bit different, but not, not much different, okay? Waiting a year, two years, three years for somebody to pay their dues, I, I just don't see a justification for that, okay? And one point that's always brought up to me, which is a good point, is, well, Steve, our dues are only $100 a year. So do we really want to go after, you know, for $100? I would say yes. Uh, and, you know, we've, we've practiced in most of the counties in North Carolina and South Carolina. And uh, consistently, you know, the, the judges and the clerks and the magistrates, if they're delinquent, they're delinquent. You know, we, we don't have clerks or magistrate or judges say, well, this isn't really enough money to go after um, because it's legally owed. And, and you know, the statutes and the law uh, give us the authority to, to, to move forward. So it may only be a small debt, but going it after it soon uh, is much better for everybody. If you don't turn it over for collections, then just know, and I think you all know this, that you're risking uh, losing the money, okay? If there's no lien filed on a piece of property and that house sells, or they file bankruptcy or, or, or they die, uh, then there's a chance you're not gonna get paid. A strong chance you're not gonna get paid. So, you know, that $100 you let slide last year, that, that additional $100 you let slide the year before that, and maybe that third year, well, if the person sells their house and there's no lien, they can go and, and not pay. Uh, some closing lawyers will reach out and try to find the management company and get a statement of account and get you paid, which is great, but it's not guaranteed. It's not guaranteed. So. It's important to get a lien uh, fairly early. I think this will make you all feel much better about the collections. If you were to give us uh, 20 accounts, let's say, we've been keeping statistics like this for a long time. 50% of the people pay when we send our demand letter. Okay, the very first letter that goes out the door, 50% of the people pay. Okay, so you're not, you're not being mean to them necessarily. It's over. Uh, another four will pay when we file the lien. Okay. And then when we file foreclosure, another two pay. When we go to the court, and maybe between the court and the sale, another one pays. And then believe it or not, after we foreclose, uh, some people pay. So um, the point of the story is a lot of people pay very early in our collection process. When we say it's a foreclosure process, it is. It is. It could ultimately end up in foreclosure. But overwhelmingly, I'd say 80 to 85% of the time, the homeowner pays in full 
and the association is made full and the homeowners and, and not at risk of foreclosure anymore and it's over. So real quickly, um, this is a statistic I think is very interesting too. When you're uh, foreclosing on people, I was talking about making mistakes and, and how you do your foreclosures. Just analyze what you're foreclosing on. On the far left-hand side, and, and this is success rates is what this is. Uh, when it's just an empty lot, there's no house, then it's vacant land. And the success rate of collections is fairly low because the owner may just let it go. And they may owe taxes on it too. And there may be a mortgage on it too. And they just might let it go. So I'm not saying don't move forward. I'm just saying, take a good look at it. Uh, abandoned houses, you know, the grass is two feet tall and the bushes are over digging the windows. You know, it's 30% of the time we can collect on that. And that's something we probably want to talk about. All the green ones, we would say move forward on. Okay, uh, if it's for sale, but not occupied, somebody cares about that house and they're probably gonna pay. Same with rental, but not occupied. You know, there's a for lease sign in the yard, they're most likely gonna pay. Uh, rental property that is occupied, clearly they wanna save the house. And if there's a primary residence, there's really no question uh, that you wanna move forward with those. All right. Okay. This is one of the more interesting ones. I told you I got some good stories for you tonight. Top mistake number six, individual board members, director, board of directors communicating with homeowners, okay? I know you guys are neighbors with these people. I know you like them. Some of them are your friends, but please be careful how you communicate with them, okay? About board business anyway. And because they're gonna hear kind of what they wanna hear um, and you gotta be careful. We had a case, gosh, 10 years ago now, 12 years ago, where the guy was going to build a pool. Uh, he gave plans. Turns out we, he built something that was different than what he got approved. And the president went over to his house and they were friends. The president went over to his house and it was going to be a bar outside, by the way, at the pool house. And uh, the president said, this is going to be fantastic. This looks amazing. It was just the footings at the time, I believe, or it was staked out. This is going to be amazing. I can't wait to have a beer at the bar of your new pool house. I don't know how many times I heard that during the trial. I mean, it was a, a week long trial. Each side spent a tremendous amount of money. Um, now, that wasn't what won or lost the case, uh, but it was certainly something we had to deal with. Is that the president appeared to have approved the size of it by the stakes in the ground? So just be careful. We have a, a recent case actually where there were some uh, a big man, a big association was looking for uh, new management and this was a large management contract and so there were some candidates and the president made some comments to one of the candidates that made them feel like they had the the job uh, and some of the comments were pretty strong that that could be interpreted that way um, and. So that created some issues that have now cost that association quite a bit of money for me to untangle uh, because the president was just trying to be nice to somebody and encourage them, I guess, but overstepped and said some things that we then had to deal with. So be careful with that. One of my favorites, um, there's a homeowner in a condominium where he sends a tremendous amount of emails and you guys might have one of these in your neighborhood. Uh, to the board and to the manager. I mean, I'm talking you know, dozens and dozens and dozens. I think I have 800 emails from him, me, uh, in the last two years. So he's one of those keyboard warriors. Well, the board got tired of it. And so one of the board members said, I'm just gonna go talk to him. I'm, I'm just gonna go over there and talk to him. Uh, he went over, knocked on the door. The, the gentleman didn't come to the door. Uh, the next round of emails that we got from the homeowner was about how this board member came over and banged on his door for 20 minutes to where he thought it was gonna come off the hinges and that he was terrified and that he was being harassed, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. So you see how trying to talk to individual homeowners about things is just dangerous, you need to be careful. Last point I'll make on this is board members have what are what's called in the law, apparent authority, okay? And that means that it appears you might have authority. So if you tell somebody, wow, this, this staked out area for your pool looks great. I can't wait to have a beer at the bar. Well, people might be able to rely on that. Or if you say, hey, you've got this contract, no problem. I'm sure you're going to get it. That might be a problem because you may have apparent authority to bind the association individually. Be careful, please. 
All right, top mistake number seven, not seeking or following expert advice. Please listen and consider your recommendations from your lawyer, from your community association manager, from other experts you talk to, CPAs, engineers, landscapers, plumbers, contractors. Um, I will tell you, this doesn't happen to me very often, I don't think, is you know, I'll give an opinion, I'll give some recommendations and, and they do the opposite. That doesn't happen that I'm aware of, or if they do, I fire the, the client. Um, but listen to your experts, okay? That's the best way for you to insulate the board of directors and the association and yourself from any kind of liability. If an engineer tells you to do something, it goes wrong, that's on the engineer. OK, uh, so please listen to your contractors. I just put on here Surfside Condominium Florida, because although we have no idea yet why that that condominium down there collapsed, there's a lot of fingers pointing towards uh, experts who told the board of directors as early as 2018 about some problems. Um, and it doesn't appear that you know, they, they moved quickly on that. Uh, so maybe they were looking for other opinions. Who knows? But just know that that's absolutely going to be one of the questions that's asked is did you listen to the experts? Did you listen to these engineers? And what did you do about it when they told you to do these things? So just be careful. All right, I know I'm getting close on time here, but I wanna go through poll D, last poll for tonight. The following are likely a violation of the Fair Housing Act. Adult swim at the association's pool. No children under the age of six at the pool without adult supervision, that's what that says. No skateboarding in the parking lot between 4 and 6 p.m., high traffic times. Computers in the clubhouse are reserved for children to do homework. I don't know if you can see all those words. You may have to expand your screen there. So adult swim at the association's pool. No children under the age of six at the pool without adult supervision. No skateboarding in the park lot between 4 and 6 p.m., high traffic times. Computers in the clubhouse are reserved for children to do homework. Which of those are a violation? of the Fair Housing Act. All right, coming in. Give me about three more seconds here. All right. Adult, the answer is all of the above are likely violations of the Fair Housing Act. So, so it looks like a, a good majority of you uh, decided on that, which is correct. Uh, I'm going to go through these really quickly. Adult swim at the pool is a violation of the Fair Housing Act, in my opinion, because it's a violation of familial status protection. And what that means is you can't treat people with children differently than people without children. And having adult swim treats people differently because you family with children don't get to swim as much as these people without children. So uh, no children under the age of six in the pool without adult supervision. Believe it or not, I think that's a violation of the Fair Housing Act. Um, to require someone to be with a minor at the pool. Talk to your lawyer about this because in North Carolina, the law is a little bit different uh, than South Carolina, but talk to your lawyer. If you have a rule that says minors have to be uh, attended at a pool. No skateboard parking in the lot between four and six, that targets children, absolutely targets children. And that's a violation in my opinion. Computers in the clubhouse are reserved for children to do homework. That is a violation in my opinion. This is strange. Why is it a violation? Because you're actually treating families with children better than families without children because they get exclusive use of the computers for a certain amount of time, more time than people without children. So it can work the other way. Yeah, fair housing is a minefield. So be careful. I'm sorry, I didn't share that with you. So I'll let you look at that for just a second. But the answer was all of the above. All the above are potential violations of the Fair Housing Act. I know I'm running a little bit short on time here, so I want to get, get us through the last few here. Top mistake number eight, fair housing violations. All I'm going to say about this is to really educate you on a new law that came out a couple of years ago. If you are aware of discriminatory conduct occurring between homeowners in the community and you know about it or you learn about it somehow, go talk to your lawyer because there is now a, a, an obligation to do something, okay? Even if you're not involved, even if the manager's not involved and the board's not involved and the association's not involved, if two homeowners, well, if somebody complains to you that they're being discriminated based on race, color, religion, sex, familial status, having children, uh, or national origin um, or handicap, talk to your lawyer. Chances are there's something you're supposed to do. 
I'm going to drill down on this one a little bit because it's it, it's one of the biggest violations I see or one of the biggest mistakes I see boards do. Policies and procedures regarding minors. If you have anything in your governing documents, in your pool rules, in your clubhouse rules, in your governing documents of the that are recorded with the courthouse that says minors, children, is an age, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, it, then you need to have your lawyer look at it because there's a very good chance that violates the Fair Housing Act. It seems ridiculous. I get it. Why would you want to be allow, able to have a six-year-old at the pool by themselves unattended? You need to kind of talk with your lawyer through that because um, there are some safety exceptions, but not always. So just be careful. That's the one I see my boards trip over all the time. Any language regarding conduct specific to minors can get you into trouble. For example, no skateboarding in the parking lot. Talked about that, but that's probably minors. No toys left in the common area. Well, who plays with toys? Children, minors. Uh, that could get you into some trouble. Oh, one, always. No, di no baby's diapers in the pool. No diapers in the pool. That talks about children. Talks about, you know, uh, so that singles out families with children. Now, how do you get around that? It's not, it's not rocket science, but you say no incontinent persons in the pool without proper coverage, okay? That's adults and children. So that's what you have to do. You have to kind of finesse the language to stay out of trouble. And that's the personal property, no toys, diapers, that sort of thing. Just keep that in your head. Top mistake number 10, and this should probably have been higher up on the list, uh, but uh, dealing with handicap issues. When a handicapped person asks for something, that should send up all sorts of red flags uh, because the law says that you have to reasonably accommodate them for what they're asking for, assuming it's connected to their disability. Uh, for example, most common is a ramp. You know, I'm in a wheelchair, I need a ramp, or I can't do stairs, I need a ramp. Well, that's an analysis that you need to go through because denying a ramp is for a disabled person or a handicapped person that needs it is absolutely a fair housing violation and can cost a lot of money. Now, you may, you might be thinking, well, of course, Steve would let them have a ramp. But there are all sorts of accommodations. We had one last month where a uh, deaf person wanted a sign language person at the annual meeting. I need a sign language person. Well, are they handicapped? Yes. Do we need to accommodate them reasonably? Is that a reasonable accommodation? Maybe, possibly. So, you know, it's, it's not just the obvious, okay? And, and here's a minefield uh, for you, is mental illness also applies. And th those are not ones you can see easily. You know, a handicapped person in a, in a wheelchair, you can see that. You know, a blind person or something, you can see those kinds of things, but mental illness applies too, so be careful. Reasonable modifications to real estate, that's the ramp I was telling you about. Also reasonable modifications or accommodations to rules. We had one two weeks ago where a, a handicapped person wanted to come to the pool before it opened with their physical therapist to use the pool before it opened. Well, that's not, that's kind of against the rules, against our policy of our open hours, but do we need to accommodate that? So just be aware that if somebody asked you for something and it appears they may have a disability, you need to run to your lawyer and talk to them. All right, that's the top 10 mistakes the board of directors have made. I know I gave you a lot of information tonight, uh, but I hope it's been helpful. Do we have any questions, Ben? Well, there are several that have come in. I'll ask a quick question. Just so let's say somebody asked for an accommodation regarding a swimming pool opening early that may be handicapped. How would you answer that question? I can't give you a formal legal opinion because I haven't reviewed the governing documents, <laughs> but off the cuff, I would probably look for another alternative. You know, maybe if you can put up one of those little floating uh, partitions, you know, those things that float on the surface like swim lanes could you partition a area off to where they could bring their therapist and just have that dedicated area during regular hours? Could you do that? Uh, are there other things you could do? Do you have to open early for them? So most pools aren't ready to open and call them swim ready from whether chemicals or something else. So if the pool is not ready and, and it costs you $2,000 to open the pool early, um, is that a reasonable accommodation? Right. That, that they would have to pay. Great point. Great question. And that goes into the reasonableness balance. You know, I was just thinking, you got to open the gate an hour early and let them go in and swim. That might be reasonable. But if it costs us $2,000 to do that because of other reasons, then that really moves the balance the other way. 
Um, now, whether or not you can make the requesting party pay for the accommodation or the modification, that's a whole nother seminar we would have to do. That, that's got some, some pieces to it. So um, one question I, you, you mentioned early on about trash cans and being on a public street and not in, maybe trying to enforce rules that are driven around a, a city policy. Um, can you enforce city policy rules by the association? If the city says, you know, all trash cans need to be removed from the street by 12 a.m. or 12 p.m., but your documents don't say anything, can the association enforce those documents? The short answer is no. We do not have any inherent authority to enforce municipal laws or traffic laws or any kind of uh, laws like that. Now, some of you out there have language in your declarations, very rarely, but some of you do, that say no unlawful conduct shall be conducted on the lot or within the community. So that basically says the association might have the ability to enforce every law. You see the problem with that, but that's really the only way you would have an argument about the trash cans is if we had the no unlawful conduct and we'd have to really look at that. But no, I'd say 95% of you don't have that language and you're not able to enforce municipal laws. So another question, you mentioned something about um, defining terms that may be vague within a governing, in your governing documents. Um, you know, oftentimes we see documents that have the community-wide standard written in there, which is a very open-ended term. How do you define the community-wide standard? Yeah. And that's a great example of what the courts would be looking at. Um, and there's a case in North Carolina actually about community-wide standard, but it's not a published opinion, if I remember correctly, um, that wasn't favorable to us uh, for the reasons we've discussed. You know, what's a community-wide standard? What is that? So I think, Ben, the, the question really is, well, can we then define community-wide standard? Can we put together maybe a policy or, or some rules, let's not call them rules, but let, you know, a policy that defines what community-wide standard is? You can. Um, I think it's got some problems. We have lots of clients that do. Let me just put it that way. Uh, but when push so, comes to shove and you're in front of a judge, it, it might be slippery. Okay. Another question. Um, is there a difference between the board making a rule versus establishing certain policy resolutions? Yeah, we did not get into policies tonight. Uh, what I, the way I see it is you've got your declaration or your master deed in South Carolina, your declaration, you've got your bylaws. That's the document that tells you how to run the company. How many board members do you have? What notice do you give? Then you've got your uh, rules and regulations. We've talked about that. That's the common area stuff. Then you've got policies. And the way I see policies are your collection policy. How delinquent are they until they go to the lawyer? Your enforcement policy. How many letters do they get before they get this? Uh, your, you know, whatever kind of how you're going to do things type policy is what I see policies as. Okay. Um, so you spoke earlier about common area rules and adopting, um, say, within units or lots, but you didn't speak about limited common elements. Can associations that have limited common elements in, invoke um, no smoking rules on a limited common element? Wow. Great question. <laughs> Great question. All right. So this could all be very specific to your association. So I'm just giving you some general knowledge, okay? I, this isn't a formal legal opinion. So please talk to your lawyer. Um, I see where I start is that limited common elements are a subcategory of common elements, okay? So if we're allowed to make rules and regulations about common elements, then we should be able to make rules and regulations about limited common elements, okay? Now, that can all change by your governing documents. I mean, your governing documents can say that the owner has the exclusive use to maintain, repair, and replace, and use. I mean, there's all sorts of ways your governing documents could change that answer. Okay. Next question. I don't know if this is North or, North or South Carolina, so it may vary, but um, condo association bylaws or documents do not reference our ability to fine for violations. Can the board implement a fine structure? and um, for common areas and other rules and regulations adopted by the board? North Carolina, yes, if your condominium was built after 1986, okay? So that's statutory. You have the ability to fine for any, for enforcement of any of the association's governing documents. 
what's in the declaration, what's in the bylaws, what's in your rules and regulations about the lobby. You know, so lots of strong authority in North Carolina. In South Carolina, it is driven by your governing documents. So you'd have to look at your governing documents and make sure you have the ability to find owners. And if so, what's the process? That's very contract driven in South Carolina. Okay, we have two satellite dish questions. Um, you spoke about single family home satellite dish placement. Um, can you talk a little bit about how they apply to condominiums? Yep, I, I missed that part. Owners are owners are only allowed to put satellite dishes in areas that they may own. Okay, so in a single family home, they own everything. So you can, you know, they, they get to put it pretty much wherever they want to, uh, subject to some other things that you want to talk to your lawyer about. Townhomes are the same. Okay, because they own the roof. So that's their roof. And so could they put it on their roof? Most likely, yes. And yes, that's got some problems with the maintenance of the roof and they're punching holes to install it and all that. Uh, that's another discussion. Condominiums, though, condominiums, the roof are, are common elements. So they don't own that. It's not their roof. So no, they cannot put the satellite dish on their roof. And so that leads to the conclusion that I'm sure is being asked. And that is, well, if they're not the only place they can put it usually is on a balcony, okay? And sometimes it's only wholly within their balcony. They can't even put it on the railing pointing out. So the punchline is sometimes condominium owners just simply can't have satellite. Yep. So um, question, it says, we do not allow flags other than the U.S. flag and North Carolina flag in our front yards or front lawns. Uh, we had an owner showing a British flag in their window acting as a curtain. Is that allowed? This, this fits in really nicely with the architectural control because remember one of my bullet points was it's only on the outside. You can't control what color their living room is. You can't control what color their blinds are. So if the flag was inside their window, I'd say you have to have a recorded restrictive covenant that said you can't fly flags in your windows. So unless those covenants say all window curtains may be white or something along those lines, but occasionally see that. that that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, no, it's and, and the same thing goes with political signs. And we're not getting into that tonight. But, you know, when we are able to limit them, uh, then people put them in their windows on the inside of the windows. And that creates some hurdles. So this next question, you may not may not know the answer. You might. Um, I know it has to do with some IRS rulings, but do HOA members have to vote on what to do with leftover funds at the end of the year? I am not a tax attorney, so I'm going to, I'm going to sidestep the tax consequences of that, but I will tell you that the way most associations do it is you have a budget, and as long as you meet that budget, there are no money. there is no money left over at the end of the year, okay? So your budget should be a zero-sum budget. Now, the money that may be left over typically goes into reserves, okay? That, that's typically where it goes. Uh, does it have to go into reserves? Not necessarily. Uh, and North Carolina and South Carolina treat surplus funds, we'll call them surplus funds, uh, treat surplus funds differently. So we have to have a little bit more detail on that. Yeah, and so there are some IRS requirements regarding excess funds and other things, and so that that might be a whole other seminar. <laughs> but, yep. um, Let's see, I know there are two foreclosure questions. Um, when a board sends a property to foreclosure and it's at the point of sale, but no bids come forth, um, does ownership automatically come to the association with no other action required? Yeah, the way this works, and, and North Carolina, we, we follow the same statute the banks follow. Okay, South Carolina is a little bit different, but the, the, the end result is the same for your answer. When you're on the courthouse steps selling the house, okay, and nobody bids on the house, why wouldn't they bid on it? Well, probably because there's taxes owed. There's probably a first mortgage. There's probably a second mortgage that's all going to stay with the house. So nobody wants it. Then the association will bid what it's owed, okay? $2,500, let's say. We'll put in a bid for the association. Nobody outbids that. So the association is the highest bidder and the association will get a deed to the property for that $2,500, okay? So that's how the association gets the house. It's, it's the same thing with banks. The bank puts a house up for sale, nobody bids on it, they bid what they're owed, the bank, and the bank gets the house back. It's the same process. So that's how that happens. 
So another foreclosure question. Um, we feel foreclosure is a bit of a crapshoot, particularly when the property is mortgaged and their foreclosure is unlikely to leave anything for the HOAs um, to receive. How do you decide when to foreclose? Um, and you know, is it is somewhat of a variable act? Right. After 20 years of doing HOA collections, I can tell you with, with very little hesitation that moving forward with foreclosure is the best way for your association to get paid, okay? It's largely not about whether or not we're going to have to sell the property and get paid somehow at the end of the process, okay? Really, I showed you some statistics earlier, I believe, you know, 85, 80 to 85% of the time that the association gets paid somewhere in the foreclosure steps. So really it's about the leverage and the pressure of the foreclosure process itself that gets the association paid. So that's why I say, it doesn't matter what mortgages are on it. It doesn't matter what taxes might be owed. It doesn't matter because nobody wants to lose their house. And so just by serving them by sheriff and doing, you know, applying all this, going to court, you know, dragging them into court, that usually gets the association paid. And the question really is an equity question, an equity analysis is, well, Steve, if we're gonna sell it at the end and there's no equity, then we may get zero. That is true. Sometimes we get zero if we go all the way through, but there's only two choices. Let me, if you've heard nothing else I've said tonight on collections, take this. In my opinion, after doing it every different way I could, small claims court, collection agencies, foreclosing slow, foreclosing, I've done it all. And I can tell you there's really only two choices in HOA collections. One, don't collect. Just don't, don't put a lien on there and don't do anything else. That doesn't work in my opinion. Or move forward with the foreclosure process, apply the pressure and overwhelmingly the homeowners will pay in full before they lose their house. Yeah, and I would agree nine times out of 10, you'll, you'll get something if it's occupied. Um, you know, and the, the, the point behind it all is really to, to push and I'll use the bad owner or debtor out and bring a new person in. So, um, it's not that's, fun. <laughs> it's not that's fun. a good, that's a good point. And, and the two choices you've got, I mentioned is one is just to let them not pay, put a lien on and don't collect it. And their debt will get bigger. That can't be the answer or foreclose with the understanding you may end up not collecting, but as Ben just pointed out, you will sell the house eventually or get the house in the name of someone who will pay in the future. So yeah, stop the bleeding, move on. Okay, two um, FHA type questions. Um, in this North South Carolina, they, they have age restrictions within their public pool require swimming requirements. I think North Carolina is 16 and I can't remember South Carolina, but how is that concurrent and, and with you know, the, the FHA regulation, regulations, which are federal? We have eight HOA lawyers in my firm that do almost exclusively HOA. We have had 20 hours of discussions over that question, okay? How can the FHA punish you for having a rule when the signage requirements in North Carolina say, yeah, you have to post a sign that says, I think it's 14, but you know, it, it, it's gotta be supervised you know, under 14. Uh, or 16. Th those don't reconcile. They don't reconcile. Uh, there's not a good answer to it. Uh, there is, there's two sides of the argument, but my, my opinion is that the FHA trumps whatever sign regulation the state may have. Okay. Um, we live in a 55 and older community. You talk about FHA. Um, how does that work? Yeah. Yeah. 55 and older communities are uh, a creature of statute. They're, they're permitted by the law. There's specific statutes of how they're set up. And so they are legally allowed to discriminate because the statute says they can. Okay. How does the ARC respond to a house proposal that would require filling in the area that could potentially cause drainage problems for adjacent owners? And does it, uh, um, does the approval create any sort of HOA liability? Right. Uh, this happens all the time. Steve, is it our job as the board or the ARC to make sure they're not going to put this fence on a drainage easement? Steve, is it our job to make sure they're not going to build their fence on the neighbor's property? Steve, is it our job not to make sure that drainage isn't going to go in a direction that it's bad for somebody? And my opinion is no. My opinion is, back going back to the slide, aesthetics only. What does it look like? 
Okay, if they cause a drainage problem for their neighbor, then that's a trespass claim that they have amongst each other. It's not really our issue. So I know there's some stormwater regulation within, or maybe stormwater statute in North Carolina that also regulates how water can flow from lot to lot. Um, that might be another good topic one day for a, a session. <laughs> yep. yep. Uh, yeah. That's a very common question. I've got like three of those on my desk right now. So um, back to your, your initial, maybe I think that was uh, mistake number one, email voting. Um, can you clarify um, a, a few points about email voting? And, you know, there was a split between, is it a majority or is it unanimous? And so um, just make sure for clarity's sake, you, you said it's unanimous voting via email. Now, the talk, could you talk a little bit about the practical side of getting things done versus, um, you know, getting everybody together to hold a meeting and how do those decisions need to be made? Right. And, and here's, here's the punting approach to this because I know it's a pain. I, I know it's a pain. But let's say you have the five board members and you got Bob. Remember Bob? He's the one that doesn't respond or he always votes no, right, by email. So what do you do about Bob? One option is to call us, call a meeting of the board next Tuesday and do a 30 second meeting. I went through that. The other option, and this is not something I can recommend, but I will just tell you it is a, an option. You got three of the people who said yes by email or maybe even four, but not everybody. Let's say you do it. You change the flowers to blue, okay? Technically, did you have authority to do that? No. At the next board meeting, okay, the next duly scheduled board, maybe it's next month, maybe it's next quarter, then you make a motion at that meeting to ratify the decision that was made back in July about the flowers. All in favor of ratifying that decision? Aye. And remember, at the duly called meeting, you only need a majority to say, to ratify it. Bob can still jump up and down and say, no, doesn't matter. He gets outvoted. So you can ratify the decisions that are made with lack of unanimous consent by email. Okay. Here's an interesting one. What are the HOA options when a person with a handicapped car sticker uses it to park in a handicapped space, then rents out their own space, and the spaces are identical in the terms of access and other areas. So is there a way to enforce that or adopt a rule um, to help regulate you know, right. their abuse? There are two competing theories there. Theory number one, handicapped person may, they could, this could kind of be a, a, an accommodation they're asking for. I want to park here and rent my space out. Is that a reasonable accommodation? Is that necessary because of their handicap? I don't think so. Okay, so I don't think it's a reasonable accommodation issue. Set that aside. Then you just get into the, can you create a reasonable rule for everybody that says you can't do that and enforce it evenly? I think you probably could. But um, please, on any kind of fair housing issue, talk to your lawyer. Give them all the facts. And I'd say there are probably some nuances, whether it's a deeded space or a leased space or an assigned space. Absolutely. So you, you could probably get into um multiple yep. issues around that one. Yep, good point. Um, let's see, regarding email voting of the board, does this law apply when the board is mixed of class A and class B membership? Oh, <laughs> so when you have a developer or a declarant on your board, does it change the rules? No, you just have a bigger problem because chances are the developer is not participating. So, Same rule. <laughs> right. Now, the, the weighted vote um, doesn't necessarily count in a board action. It would count on a membership action. So I think there are two, maybe two different areas with that question. Right. So, but Yeah, I think what, what they're asking is, do developers, declarants, sometimes have three votes for every lot they own? Okay, that's different voting. All board members almost always have the same number of votes. Every board member gets one vote, whether you're a declarant, not a declarant. I don't think I've ever seen it otherwise. So everybody gets one vote. So when a covenant has ambiguous language like offensive activities, that shall become unreasonable annoyance or a nuisance to the neighborhood. Who determines what a nuisance or annoyance is? 
And I'll I don't you. remember the case. What's, what's the case that everyone cites all the time? Yeah. Um, <laughs> this, this goes back to kind of the pendulum swinging over the courts being more favorable to homeowners, okay? Um, and offensive and nuisance are two of the most common provisions that we need to use, but they are very weak, very weak. Uh, offensive, I just can't imagine succeeding in court on what's offensive. Uh, because what's offensive to me is different than what's offensive to Ben, which be a definition means it's ambiguous. If it has, do, if it can have several definitions, um, nuisance, a legal nuisance, are things more like cement factories that spew dust everywhere, or hog farms that you can smell from a mile and a half. I mean, those are legal nuisances. Your neighbor playing their music at 11:30 at night on Thursday night, I don't think it rises to that kind of level. So, yeah, for those associations, and most of you are in this box that only have that language offensive, nuisance, annoyance. If that's all you've got, what I've advised is you can use it. I mean, you can use it to send a violation letter. You can use it to halt, call a hearing if you have finding authority. Um, but you're, I can't recommend you go too far with it. If you can't solve the problem early on in that enforcement process, we're not filing a lien for fines based on that. And we're not going to foreclose, certainly not going to foreclose based on that language. So does the ARC, so an architectural control committee or review committee, operate independently of the board of director? Oh, yeah. and, and should the board be informed of decisions prior to notifying the homeowners? Yeah. Okay. Um, the reason I'm smiling is because I've actually litigated cases about this because the architectural control committee in almost all associations, North Carolina and South Carolina, are set up this way. You have a board of directors who can appoint an architectural control committee. That architectural control committee has all of the authority in most cases to approve and deny things. They don't have to talk to the board. They don't have to ask the board. They don't get to, they don't have to show the board anything. That's the way it's set up almost always. So board members out there, be careful who you appoint to your architectural control committee. Make sure they think similarly to you on what they approve and deny. Sometimes, there is some interaction between them required, but very rarely. So architecture control committee, yes, they, they drive the bus almost exclusively. Now, there's a law in North Carolina or a case in North Carolina rather, that says that the board of directors can be the architectural control committee. Okay, that's the Harris versus Bodine case. Um, so you can be a board member and architectural committee at the same time, which a lot of associations do because I can't find the volunteers. Now, what happens if your architecture, here's the question. What happens if the architectural control committee is approving things you don't want or you disagree with strongly? Can you reverse that? Most likely not. Can you veto it? Probably not. In fact, I'll say 99% no. Your remedy as a board of directors is to remove your architectural control committee members. Say you're out. We're disbanding that group of people and we're gonna find new people to do it. People who will approve what we want, the kind of things we want to approve. Or we'll do it ourselves. The board will do it. So, um what can be allowed or denied on condominiums with regards to signs and flags? And I'm guessing this is around common area and maybe limited common areas. In, most, in almost all cases, um, owners have no rights to put things on the common area. So the grass outside, common area. The roof, common area. The siding on the outside, common area. So they can't put flags or signs there they may be able to put them on their limited common area, depending on how much language they get. Do they get to maintain it, use it exclusively, that sort of thing? Then maybe they can have their flag out there, uh, but it's very limited. Now, can they put them in their windows? We've talked about that. You know, that's inside their unit and you better have a restrictive covenant on record at the courthouse that lets you control that if you're gonna to try to control it. Okay, do, t do TV antennas have the same rules as a dish network antenna. Our bylaws restrict TV antennas and they say they must be in the attic. Um, but do we have the ability to limit placement? There is no federal FCC protection for TV antennas, internet antennas, larger dishes. You know, we're talking about the little dishes that have the protection, right? like dish network and dish TV. Um, so no, there is no protection, federal protection, like we've been talking about for other types of antennas. Those fall under the architectural control. You can approve okay. it or deny it. 
Okay, so this one is a maybe a repeat question, but thank you for the response on setting fines. Unfortunately, our condos were built prior to 1986. Should I assume that we can't implement fines? Sorry, pulling my statute book. Um, <laughs> are we North Carolina or South Carolina? Did, this, did they say uh, North, North Carolina, 1986, North, North Carolina? I know the answer. I just want to make 100% sure since we're, we've got a lot of people listening here. Forty-seven, forty-seven C three one zero two. You have to go to the applicability section. Yes, you would still have the finding authority. So why don't you explain? Because there, the this is where the statutes get a little confusing, um, and I think we do have one of the documents that we can share. That's what's applicable post. Uh, and what's applicable pre um, with both statutes for condominium and um, and uh, yeah, single that, family? Yeah, that, that's a, that would be a great presentation, actually. But here, let me give you the 10 second answer. The Plan Community Act and the, and the Condominium Act, those are the real ones in North Carolina anyway. South Carolina, sorry, you don't have the, the, these kind of robust statutes, but um, they both have certain provisions that are only forward after 1986 for condos and after 1999 for homeowners and townhomes. Okay. So newer, newer communities have more rights to the statute, more, more powers in the statute, but some of the statute in each case is retroactive. Okay. That you can use. Um, and, and it would take probably an hour to, to kind of list which ones are, are prospective and, and, and uh, retroactive, but yeah. And again, this is one of those things you've got to talk to your lawyer about because it, you're getting into real minutia here. Uh, so before you go finding anybody on this condo, talk to your attorney. So we have owners that are questioning the amount of impervious surface that is being installed in a new home build. If the board receives this potential issue with impervious amounts, I want to confirm that it's still not the responsibility of the ARC committee or board. Unless your declaration says the words impervious surface, then I don't think it's an HOA issue. And let me, let me add one thing to that. Remember, the courts are killing us right now, associations, because they'll look at those documents and look for very specific language and very specific authority for the association to do something or to care about something. And if it's not in our governing documents, we probably don't have authority to talk about it or do anything about it. So I, I can say that in developing communities um, and close to the lake, at least in the Charlotte area, impervious surfaces are taken very serious. And so uh, that does limit um, from a developer, they must track the impervious surface that's allowed on each lot. So um, if your community is still developing, you, you will probably have to have some involvement with impervious surfaces um, at least in my experience, what I've seen. Yeah. And, and that's one of those things that somebody just calls code enforcement or, you know, the zoning department or whoever, you know, looks after impervious surface and that'll get addressed. And it, yeah, once it, it transitions to the homeowner uh, side of things, it's really more of an owner to, you know, owner to county type issue. Um. Could you address electronic membership voting for notifications about annual meetings and budget ratification meetings? Can we do these via email? I wish, everybody wishes. Um, and the, the law just has not caught up with technology yet. I think it will. Um, the quick answer, and this North Carolina, South Carolina are about the same on this, but there is no statutory or case law authority to support an association's ability to just send electronic notices for the annual meeting or the, you know, uh, there's just not authority to do that in the law. Now, whether or not your governing documents could permit it. If your declaration said that electronic notice is sufficient, then you may have a much, much stronger argument. Uh, we're probably two or three years away from the law catching up and allowing us to do that. But so my quick answer is most of you can't do that. 98% of you probably can't do that. Um, could you amend your documents to do it? Creatively, yes. You could probably get away with it. 
Okay, I think we have two questions left. Um, so our covenants give the, the resident board the ability to appeal 